Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Good morning all. We are in Micah chapter 5. Those of you reading in your Hebrew Bible, chapter 4, 14, verse, um, chapter 4, verse 14. It should not be chapter 14, 14. It should be ver chapter 4, verse 14. There are a few places in our, in our English Bibles that do not follow the Hebrew Bibles. And if you're going back and forth, it gets to be difficult. Some of my, my computerized Hebrew Bibles um, make up for that, and they follow the English text, uh, at least when they're doing the transliteration uh, portion of it, so you can, you can follow. But there are a couple that don't. And when I was writing the material, the, the Hebrew Bible that I was using didn't follow, doesn't follow the... Uh, doesn't follow the the English text and so I couldn't find the right the right text in the Hebrew Bible and it just kind of messed me up but anyway Micah chapter 5 1 in our English translations is verse 4 14 in the Hebrew text oh you're right see I even marked it there and I didn't even look at my mark <laughs> I'll be okay Wow. Wow. No, it still applies. Just remember it in a little while. Sheesh. It's a hardcore group today. I can handle Catherine. Okay. Verse 8, which is before chapter 5, verse 1. In both, in both, because in Hebrew, chapter 4, verse 8 is chapter 4, verse 8. We'll see later that it's not that case. How's that? Good recovery? Clear as mud. Chapter 4, verse 8. I thought we finished the chapter, though. No? Well, I'm losing my mind. Yes, it is. I will uh, find my mind next week in Haiti. Well, it won't be it won't be hot, so it won't be real hot, and we're staying at the hotel. So I knew you were going to rub that in. It will be like like we have been here. It'll be in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, and humid like we are here. I mean, it's the same kind of environment. Except we have air conditioning in the. Right, but they'll, have, they'll get relief every day. <laughs> because we'll have nice running hot and cold water and a swimming pool and, swimming pool and, yeah, and all that. No, we're, eating at the, we're eating at the Institute for lunch every day. Oh, yeah, we'll have mystery meat once or once, twice. Might be goat. I think it was. Armadillo. You know what armadillo is, right? Possum on a half shell. <laughs> okay, let's get back to chapter 4, verse 8. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. When are we talking about? Just from, just remember what we've talked about and think about what those words say, what period of time would you believe that we're talking about here? Millennium, exactly. Hi. Where?
Oh, McDelladere? Yeah. yeah. W what? W yeah. The net says what, Ann? The uh, tower would be McDelladare. Uh, o you tower, or McDelladare, of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, or from uh, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. The Messiah will rule from Jerusalem, making Jerusalem the center of the world. I was studying this week in preparation for Wednesday night. Uh, giving you uh, the resurrections uh, in, uh, in Scripture, the biblical view of the resurrections. And, uh, of course, quite a bit focused on the millennial kingdom. And uh, one of the things that, that we need to, to think about is when people are raised from the dead and who participates in the millennium. And one of the things that I had forgotten, I knew it a long time ago, but I had forgotten until, until this study, is that not only will Jesus be on the throne, but David will be his regent, his vice president, what, how, his, uh, his, his uh, prime minister, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so we have, we have that flavor throughout the minor prophets that their guy, not just Jesus, but the, the David himself, will be in a position of, of great authority, the number two man in the, uh, in the world. And uh, though that flavor filters through the, the, minor, the minor prophets. The seat of power will be the entire of the entire world will be Jerusalem. Some commentators have argued Jesus is the king of the world, David is the king of Israel during the millennial kingdom. Um, what we need to recognize is that during the Millennial Kingdom, Israel, um, both nationally and ethnically, will have special privileges and purpose. Uh, that, that is contrary to our American ideal, that everybody is created equal. Well, some are created more equal in the Millennial Kingdom. And the Millennial Kingdom is all about Israel. And Israel will have special privileges and will have special position and uh, special, uh, special billing before, before the king. And good. So with that in mind, it could work out very well that Jesus is the king of the world and, Jesus, and uh, David is the king of Israel. Kind of a, a second tier king to the king of the world. We will have a world government, a perfect world government, with a perfect jurist as, as head, and he will, he will rule uh, over everything. Now, logistically, that means, you know, you're going to have to break it down. You know, one of the instructions that God gave Moses was, break it down into groups. That's where we get Republican, uh, re a republic form of government from, is the way God instructed Moses, through Moses' father-in-law, to build your, your system of representatives. And that, that most, most certainly will be part of the, the, the mixture. Uh, whether or not we have nations is hard to tell because the use of the word in, in the prophets for nations may mean people groups or it may mean political groups, and it's hard to tell which is which. So I think probably there, there will be people groups that become political groups uh, around, the, but they all will report to, to Jesus. So, like, you know, and obviously, too, <coughs> we will have, as, as saints, you know, a position of authority or rule alongside whatever that looks like. But, like, you know, even with what we're saying with David, you know, where, where he's going to be positioned, you know, you 
you got to assume, okay, is he qualified for that position based off of his body of work here on earth? I would say yes, because of the responsibility that, that he had. So do you think it's safe to say for all of us to, to see where we're at now currently and say that we're gaining experience that is not to be wasted and, and we'll prob probably be used in some capacity at this time? Yeah, Chuck would say that, that background in... Wait, wait a minute. When is there no sin? Well, we're talking about the millennium. No sin is is after after the thousand years. Satan is loosed for a season, and then Satan is vanquished to the bottomless pit forever. I'm sorry, to hell and Hades are are vanquished forever with Satan and new heaven and new earth. Then sin is gone. But during the Millennial Kingdom, who, who, who gets into the Millennial Kingdom? Everybody that's in their natural sin-infected bodies. And the little babies that, they're born, that they have will have the ability to sin just like our little babies had the ability to sin. Right. We won't sin because we'll be in our glorified state, but the natural people will sin. And uh, I think you can argue that toward the end of the millennium, it, it is not as good as at the beginning of the millennium. I think you can make a case for that. Yep. Everybody that's not a believer is dead at the end of the at the end of the tribulation. So it's only believers that get into the millennium, but they birth non-believers. So as we get closer to the rapture now, I mean we're closer today than we were yesterday. Is it not the same truth? You, you feel like this, this, I mean, there's nothing new underneath the sun. So we're not we're not committing new forms of sin. We're just maybe committing more of it. And I. I think you can argue that we're not even committing more of it than at certain other points in our history. During the time of Paul, the, 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 the morality of the world was much like it is today. You know, uh, I outlined it in, in a paper I wrote for us here one time about the four different kinds of, of marriage that were permissible in, in the Roman Empire. One of the permissible kinds of marriage was rent a wife. We call that today prostitution. But you could go out and get a wife for a couple hours at the motel. You were legally married and when you were done you were unmarried. That was a legal form of marriage in at the time of Paul. The morality of, of society was was very much like ours today. That's the difference with mass media, with, with, with Facebook and, and Instagram and all the ways that you can share all the stupid things that you do. I mean, it, really, that's what goes on on Facebook a, a great deal, is people sharing the stupid things that people didn't used to know you did. So it looks like we're worse off than, than the world has been. I don't think we, we really are. Now, it is true that as we get closer to, to the end, apostasy gets greater. And I think that is true. We are, the, the church is, is, more, is more apostate than it was. But it has been at times this apostate. During, you know, in 1000 AD, the church wasn't much to speak of. You know, coming up to the Reformation in the 1500s, the church wasn't much to speak of, and then 
only after the Reformation. And so we go in these cycles. Um, I, I think that, that with the, with the thousand years that there will, and, and thousand years meaning how many more generations of sinful people, that we, we have this, this misconception, I think misconception, that everything is, is rainbows and unicorns, and I didn't bring my unicorn, sorry, um, for the entire thousand years. But history would say that's not a good way to view that because as, as sinful people birth babies, they're sinful and maybe more sinful in, in, just can, in a thousand years. So how has the world changed from 1000 AD to now? You know, quite a difference. Even though Jesus is on the throne and he will be, he will be dealing with sinfulness, sinfulness will still pervade. And I think that might be part of the point of the millennium. I'm just not, I'm just not getting progressive, getting worse progressively, progressively, however you want to call it, from the beginning to the end when, when, let's say, Jesus will be on the throne. Saved people will also be with him. You don't have to look very far. You don't have to look very far. Just go to the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. There you have people that don't have this in nature walking with God in the garden and they still sin. So we're kind of, we're kind of not thinking logically if we think that people with this in nature walking with Jesus in, in the millennial kingdom won't commit sins. It's a cycle. I think I will. I reading, a reading yesterday, uh, it, it, I think is a prime example of this, out of uh, Genesis 4 through, uh, actually midway through 6, actually five verses through 6. At the very end of Genesis 4, it says, at that time, this is after the descendants of uh, Adam, up until Noah, at that time, people began to call the name of the Lord. Then you have all the chapter 5, then chapter 6 starts, and then it says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of, wickedness of man was great on the earth, and, um, and that every tension of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So you have this period where everybody's calling on the name of the Lord, and then not even, there's a chapter, and then, you know, one later after that one, you have, you know, people turning away from the Lord, so it's the same thing as what one is saying. So I guess we do have a lot of evidence of that. And? All that from Mac, Micah 4 8. <laughs> Verses 9 and 10. Yes, it was a hippopotamus drill. Now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? The pain seized you like a woman in labor? 
Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in open country, and you shall go to Babylon. Then you shall be rescued, and the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. As I said last week, as you're reading Micah, you have to be prepared to shift gears quickly. Because he was just talking about the millennial kingdom, now he's back in his own time period. He, he, he tells him in, in chapter 4, verse 8, how things are going to go in the millennial kingdom, and now he jumps right back to his time period and his own um, situation and warns the people about the pain and judgment they'll, they'll, that they'll go through before verse 8 comes true. Before verse 8 comes true, they're going to go through some tremendous pain. And I think we don't appreciate the pain that the Jews went through when they were taken captive and removed from the land. Remember their religious system, their whole relationship with God was based on a covenant dealing with the land. God said first of all to Abraham, I will give you this land and your descendants through, through your son will occupy this land as long as they're good. When they follow me, they'll get to stay. When they don't follow me, they'll have to go. And that was repeated over and over again for Israel. And their whole relationship with God in that covenant was based on that piece of dirt that we call the Levant. From promise to Abraham from Syria over to the Euphrates River down to Egypt. All of that land that we call the Levant is promised to Israel. And as long as they remain faithful to God, they will remain in the land. So when God finally has enough and he removes them from the land, their whole relationship with God is destroyed. We don't appreciate that enough for Israel, that being removed from the land was a big deal. It's not like, it's not like any other people. The closest maybe we could argue would be the, the American Indians and, and our forced removal of them from the land. The difference is no, no deity promised them that land. And no deity based a religious practice on that land. That, that would be the, the big difference. So Israel is now about to go through some, some traumatic religious events in order to uh, pay for their, uh, for their sins. Uh, Micah predicts that the, full, the fall of the royal house and the suffering of the people is what's going to come. And certainly that occurs. And it has not been restored. The royal house of Israel doesn't get restored until Jesus and David are on the throne in the millennial kingdom. And remember, that was their own desire, that they had a royal house. Because initially when Israel was created... God was the king, and they had, they had human managers. And they said, we want a king like everybody else, and so God gave them Saul, and from that, the, the united monarchy and then the divided monarchy. They'll be captured and taken into captivity and go into exile. Um, we should note that in verse 10, that Micah predicts they will be taken into captivity in Babylon. Understand, he's writing prior to Babylon becoming a power. This is still during the period of... Uh, I have, Can you show us that area you're talking about, too? Yeah. And also, I, I could be wrong, but I thought I heard... Uh, speaking of the Levant, you had said you, you don't appreciate what Obama calls yeah, I don't, I don't appreciate that, that he and his administration are the only ones in the world to call this Islamic uh, state ISIL instead of ISIS. In, it's not the Islamic state in, in, uh, in Syria and the Levant, which is what ISIL means. That's a slam on Israel. That is basically giving Israel to ISIS. It's the Islamic state in Syria and Iraq. 
what they really are is the Islamic, the Islamic State of Syria and Iraq. What they want to be is ISIL, and, and, and Obama is giving them credit for something that they're not. He, he is giving them permission for that, yes. Okay. Um, the Levant is... But, uh, their, but their goal is to take over the Levant. Well, their goal is to take over the world. Yeah, the, the Levant is, is, is holy territory to him. Not because the Levant ever was possessed by Islam other than in conquering. It was never part of Islamic history. It is just part of the narrative, this is how we destroy Israel, who we ate. The, the Levant never was part of, uh, of Muslim, uh, original Muslim uh, territory. And Jerusalem never was a holy site to Islam until much, much later. Um, Muhammad never was in Jerusalem. The Levant is, is this region here. Basically modern Israel with some of Lebanon, some of, some of uh, uh, Jordan, and down into uh, the Sinai, the valley. That's the Levant. It is, a, it is really a, 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 uh, an anthropological term um, because it is talking about the place that three continents come together. You, you, have, you have Europe here, you have Africa here, and you have Asia here. And so the Levant is that period, that po portion of, of the world where, where the three continents come together. And it has been a tremendous place of, of fighting its entire, entire existence because Europe would come south to Africa and go through the Levant. Asia would go to, through the Levant. Africa would go up through the Levant. It was, it's just an important part. Of, uh, of world history. This is the Assyrian Empire uh, at the time of, uh, of conquering of, uh, of Israel. Now, what, they, what, they, what isn't shown as clear on this particular map is Judah is still remains here. Assyria was all around it, but Judah still remained as an independent nation. Babylon is... Uh, wrong one. Babylon is down here, and they're not much of a power. They're really a city-state. They're not yet at this time a power. But eventually, Babylon gains in power, and through a, a series of attacks, particularly on, on Nineveh, or modern-day Mosul, just across the river, um, they defeat Assyria, and Babylon grows from a from a small regional power to a superpower when they take over all of Assyria's area. So for Micah, before Babylon was a power, to say they were going to be taken into captivity in Babylon, that was a big, big, bold prediction. And I would have to say he probably got laughed at by CNN and Fox News and everybody else of the, of the day. You don't have a clue what you're talking about. They're, they're just... They're nothing. And uh, within 120 years, they would be everything. Um, and so it's, it's a remarkable prophecy. Um, during the time of Micah, the Assyrians were the power, as you can see from... from mm-hmm. Yeah, only two of which we know, the Tigris and the Euphrates. So where do we think the others? Well, we, we don't because in the Pishon. We, we don't know because remember the, the, the best prevailing thought about what the world was like prior to the flood, and I keep forgetting what this word is, when all the continents were together. can't think of it. It'll come to me eventually. If, if I put my hand up during the message, you'll know I got it. Uh, and so we, we know of two of the rivers, or we know the name of two of the rivers. Whether or not those are those... Well, but we don't know that these two rivers are the two that are named. Right. Right. Because 
it is not uncommon for things to be named after other things. New York, I just saw the other for example. Waters. Yeah, no. So I didn't know if we could say. No. Um, Now, if you, with, with, the, with the combination of the continents together in one land mass, everything is different. And when the flood occurs and we have the separation of continents and we have a whole change of, we, the topography of the world changes during the flood. The oceans get deeper, the mountains get higher, and so forth. Pangea, that's it. That, that, that is all the continents together. Thank you, Google. Um, when all the continents are, to, are together. And so, were those the two? Maybe. We kind of, we kind of have a, a confirmation that it was somewhere close in this region, independent of the rivers, from the Human Genome Project, where they have traced um, mitochondrial DNA, which is DNA from the woman, and they have discovered where they, they interestingly call her Mother Eve, although they don't believe in Eve, but the original woman um, has a genetic posture as being from this region. The first stab at it put her in, in Northeast Africa. And then they realized there was a miscalculation, and when they fixed that miscalculation, it moved Northeast a little bit into somewhere in that region. So there, there is kind of an idea that maybe those rivers are the right ones, but certainly not the land mass is not the same. Yeah, you just, you just hit something that is fascinating to me. Well, we don't know where the Garden of Eden is because God sealed it and hid it. And whether it was destroyed during the flood or not is, a, is an interesting question that we have no answer for in Scripture. No, everything wasn't destroyed. A lot was destroyed and a lot was changed because land masses changed, but not everything was destroyed. Certainly anything man had built, but man hadn't built much by that time. Nothing I can say there <laughs> without getting myself in trouble. Yeah, let's go on to verse uh, 11. I think we have enough time to get that verse out, maybe. Um, verse 11 through 13, so we will finish the chapter. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be defiled, and let her eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan. They do not, uh, or that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron. I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. Did we shift gears again? In the previous verses, we're talking about the captivity. You think so? Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I'll make your horn iron, I'll make your hooves bronze, and, I shall, and you shall beat in peace as many peoples. It sounds like they win. It was an amalgam of nations, yeah. Some have tried to argue that, that the Assyrians were the many nations. But then when you go into the subsequent verses, it sure sounds like Israel wins. When does Israel win? The millennial kingdom. The end of the tribulation. 
So we again shift gears here. The whole, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. Yep, I read that. So I just don't, I'm only asking because you have a reference, a cross reference to Revelation 16 16. Mm hmm. Oh, whether the, the, yeah, the, the I'm just curious, like, where does that come from exactly? Because I just don't see it in my list. So. I definitely see some New Testament, like there's Matthew, Luke, and that's it. Well, it comes from my study. <laughs> that's what I'm asking. Where'd you get it from? Um, looking at the text and going, what's happening here? When does this event occur? This event occurs when when Jesus rides in on the white horse and says, "Ugh." or whatever he says, and they all die. Israel wins. Israel's victorious. Israel becomes the power in the world. Um, in biblical history, does Israel have a victory like this that we know of in history? No. Israel doesn't have, from, from Micah on, Israel doesn't have this tremendous victory. That only can come during the, the millennial, the end of the, the tribulation, the Battle of Armageddon. And that's why the reference to 1616. When Messiah returns to defeat the enemy of Israel, gather their people together, and the Messiah takes his place as Lord of the whole earth. That's what happens when Israel finally regains or returns to the position of supremacy in the world when Jesus is on the throne. I don't need no stinking cross-reference. You're, hey, you know you are, you're just Pathfinder. 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 I had a vision. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, just don't cast him. So that's one of the difficulties we have in some of these minor prophets. And Micah, I think, is the worst, is in and out of different time periods. And so you have to pay attention, and you have to consider what's being said. And so as, as you're looking at this, and you, you, you see in verse 11, Now many nations are assembled against you. When does Israel have many nations assembled against? True, Assyria was made up of many nations. Today. Do they have this victory? They, they've had tremendous victories, but do they have this victory? Not yet. And so it points that it has to be talking about yet future. And so uh, we come to then in, uh, in Revelation when, when Jesus destroys the armies. And what does Israel do then in the Millennial Kingdom? Dedicates their existence to service of God is what... what than what we read in, in verse 13. They shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. So, and what's being said is there's, there's no evidence of that happening as of yet. No. So then somebody who would obviously say there's a distinction between Israel and the church can say, okay, yeah, clearly this, this is yet to happen. It's going to happen. Somebody who's saying, no, the, the, the Israel's been assimilated into the church, they just bypass that. Yeah, they, 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 they make this well, they held off Assyria for a while, or something. I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you can look at this and not see the end of the tribulation and the Battle of Armageddon, the beginning of the millennium. I mean, that that is clear, and that's really the context that Micah's writing in. Here's all you're going to go through, but hang on, it's not going to be that bad forever. There will be a time when Israel again regains its place, and where we see Jesus on, the, where we see Messiah on the throne. They didn't say Jesus because they didn't know anything about Jesus. They just see the Messiah when the Messiah is on the throne and, and they, they enter into the Millennial Kingdom. The Millennial Kingdom is not a New Testament construct. It is a, an Old Testament prophetic construct that gets refined and clarified by the New Testament. Any questions on chapter 4? We didn't even get to chapter 5. Or chapter 4, verse 14. It is a good sign. And it's now 9.45. So yes, I can do 45 minutes. Without a pop-tart? Without a pop-tart. Any other questions? 
on Wednesday night, I will have a, uh, a paper for you on, uh, on the resurrections, and we can discuss that. And I can't go through the reading of Genesis without talking more about creation and so forth. Sorry, but you're just going to have to live with that. Yeah, if you can, that would prepare you. Read the, you know, 200 and some pages and my, my dissertation on Genesis 1 to 11. Where's it at? It's available on our website. Yes. I understand. On the documents section of our website, you can, you can find it. Any other questions, comments? Father, you are a great and awesome God, and as Micah displayed, you have given to certain writers the ability to know what's coming and to predict a small regional power taking over Israel and Judah. You gave to John the ability to see the, the events as they unfold in the future in the tribulation and the battle of Armageddon and the millennial kingdom. Things that are still future for us and we look forward to, to studying those things more. We look forward to uh, a new year this year where we go through your word yet again. Thank you for those that participate in studying and learning and growing. We love you and we love your word and we love to study it and get to know you and to enhance our relationship with you because we know you just a little bit better. Thank you for the blessings that you give us and for loving us. We look forward to a, a great service to follow and a, a great week of fellowship and study and a great year of service and ministry for you. Give us a great time in the service to follow in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.